Okay, so um, just let's continue. Um, now, uh, on top of touch, you can, of course, layer gestures. And I've already mentioned this in the, the overview of the big issues that uh, for gestures, for example, we don't really know how to... Uh, so if you just get a touch screen, you don't know by just looking at it what gestures are actually possible. Um, then people keep talking about natural interaction, but that's uh, also kind of a misleading term because it's very different for different people what they assume to be uh, natural. And for gestures in the widest sense, there are no standards at all. So some, uh, some in some apps, if I want to uh, dismiss something, I have to tap and hold, and then it shows me a menu. Or in some apps, I have to swipe it off the, the side of the screen. Uh, also, sometimes I have to double tap things. So it can really be different from app to app. So the only thing that's kind of an universally accepted gesture is uh, pinch zoom. Because I've, uh, maybe you've also seen already people on some kind of uh, non-interactive map where they actually try to kind of zoom in or move it. Um, so this is something most people have, have learned from the iPhone and which has been carried over to Android and other operating systems and which is just kind of universally accepted. But that's really the exception. For anything else, uh, there's not really any kind of standard or any way to, to discover them. Um, so first of all, here's an overview over what a gesture might actually be like. So there's actually a much wider area of things you could call a gesture than just something like pinch zoom. So you have, for example, you have pointing gestures, which is exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm pointing at something. Um, then you have so-called semaphoric gestures, which kind of uh, imply a certain, a certain meaning or maybe a certain command, like move over there or something. Uh, you also have, this was a dynamic one, then you have static ones like thumbs up, which conveys everything okay, um, and so on. Then you have pantomimic gestures. In this example, it's like I, I mimic emptying, emptying something, for example. Um, iconic gestures, which are used to, uh, to convey a shape. So I'm conveying a circle, or maybe I'm conveying a triangle. Also, again, static and dynamic ones. And finally, we have manipulation gestures, where I actually uh, pick an object and move it somewhere, for example. And this uh, manipulation gesture already uh, implies that I, for example, have a touch screen where I can actually make a physical connection and move it over there because same with uh, like when I pick up the, the power supply and move it somewhere else, I have of course to con con make some contact with it. So this is just an overview over how you could actually classify gestures and it's a lot more again than um, pinch zoom. So since we're on the topic, what would you say, uh, where, where would you put pinch zoom in that, uh, in that hierarchy, in that classification? So what kind of gesture would that be? What would you say? Manipulation, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe, but on the other hand, um, that's also kind of related because people say pinch zoom is so natural. Uh, have you ever gotten a larger sheet of paper if you put your fingers on a piece of paper and do this? So it's not actually a manipulation metaphor from the physical world. Um, Maybe it would be a, a semaphoric gesture because I'm signing to make some th something bigger. It's, it's debatable. So there are different interpretations for where you could actually put a specific kind of gesture. Um, for the ones shown here, it's of course more or less uh, obvious, but uh, pinch zoom already is kind of an example which doesn't have a really well-defined place in that, in that categorization. Um, now, um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> okay, sorry. So let's see how could we deal with discoverability. So there's two different aspects. Um, on the one hand, there's feedback, which 
shows you that you've executed the gesture correctly and that the command has been executed and um, that helps with, uh, with learning the gesture actually. Um, but that doesn't yet help you to discover the gesture. That's called feed forward and um, gives you already information before or during execution. And there's one interesting uh, research, uh, research that's tried to solve this for gestures. This is called Octopocus. And it's probably not very well visible. So um, this was actually usually, uh, intended for mouse gestures, but it would also work for, for touch gestures. So you can start, uh, when you start a gesture just by touching maybe, then it will show you different paths you can take to trigger different gestures. And as soon as you start on one path, then some possibilities will drop out and it will only show you the, the remaining possibilities you can, uh, you can follow to trigger something. And uh, if you do that often enough, then you don't even have to wait for this uh, uh, to show up anymore, maybe there's a, a little delay, but you can just execute the gesture right away. So this would be an approach to help people to actually learn gestures and um, uh, without knowing in the first place what's possible. Um, this is also related to some of these uh, things. So there's a really old, uh, work on marking menus by Bill Buxton, who's quite, quite uh, famous in this, in this research area. Um, marking menus basically work like this. You start with, so it's, it's menus on several levels. You open the menu, then you uh, make a stroke through one of, the, um, one of the menu items, then you pause again, and then the next menu opens. And then you make a second stroke to make the second selection. And the idea here is again, that if you've done this often enough, then you don't even have to wait for the menu to open up anymore. You can just make the stroke like here and get the same, same selection uh, as you would get with the menu itself. And, and by that you have sort of learned the, the gesture on the fly. Um, Another variant is if you have lots of commands, lots of gestures that you simply draw a letter, then you pause, and then it shows you different subcommands that start with that letter, and then you can trigger it by, um, by drawing the rest of the shape through the menu. And here also, again, if you simply draw that shape in one go, then it would trigger the com command right away without you having to wait for, them, uh, for the menu. So, these would be some ways to, to um, help people learn touch gestures without having basically to, to deliver a big manual along with the, uh, with the app. Um, but it's, this is our more research concepts. Again, this is not something which has so widely been used in, um, in real world applications. This is also, most of them have originally been designed for pen input, which some kind of has, has a subset of the same problems uh, as uh, touch, but for example, it has a much higher precision. So you could make the menus much smaller and, and still select them with a pen. So that's one of the, of the issues here maybe. If for these to work probably with touch, you would have to make them quite big and they would probably have to cover the entire screen. Okay, so I've already talked about this. What's natural? Um, this is quite different for each person. And one way to, to study this are so-called elicitation studies. Um, that means you show people some operation. For example, you show them a copy-paste operation. And then you ask them uh, on, a, on a completely static screen to, uh, to mimic the gesture they would personally find most appropriate. And um, when you do this uh, across a wider range of people, then you get quite different results. So um, here are 
This is an example which was from a study looking at a touch-enabled code editor. And um, here the command was select multiple lines. So people were shown this piece of code and uh, then asked to select the first block and just act like they had a touch screen where they can do any gesture they want, which one would be the most appropriate one to um, select multiple lines. And as you can see from, uh, from the overlaid uh, touches here, there is some kind of general trend that many people would maybe draw some kind of diagonal line across the code block, but some people um, make a stroke at the end, some people make a stroke at the front, some maybe even make a stroke in the middle. So it's quite, quite different for everyone what they think is the most appropriate gesture. And the more complex the commands get, the more, uh, the more variance you get in terms of what people would, would like to use. So it's quite, quite difficult actually to find a common ground here which, which everybody kind of agrees to. Um, yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, none that I'm aware of right now, so um, would definitely be an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't heard of anything like that so far, but I'll, I'll see if I can, can dig something up. So it's actually a very interesting question. Yes, please. Ah, okay. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So, um, I've actually seen some um, user interfaces, uh, like desktop interfaces now, which uh, swap the uh, the forward and back buttons depending on if the language is right to left or left to right, because that's uh, also the, it really has some influence on. Uh, regarding what you perceive as forward and what you perceive as backward. So that's maybe a starting point to, to look into. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Um, so let's see how long have we got. So, uh, so far for gestures, any more uh, questions or comments here? So yeah. Yes, it's not so much incorporated in the system, but from Apple you can get a really big manual with style guidelines. And um, I haven't looked into that in detail, so um, I don't know if they actually, actually suggest doing things differently depending on the language, but it might be possible because it's really very detailed. So it's really a, a big book with uh, like how many pixels each icon should have and so on. So they have very detailed guidelines and it might well be possible that they also have guidelines for that. But I can't tell for sure. All right, so I'm, I think we might have to stop a little early today but again, but I'll, um, I'll start with this topic in any case. So now the input output channel I'd like to look at is motion. Um, on the one hand, we have motion as input. So we could simply, of course, detect how the device itself is moving. And we could also try to detect how the user is moving, which is already getting a little more complicated. And um, we can use motion as output. The, the very primitive variant would be to just vibrate the phone. But there's also some little more of weird research concepts which actually try to move the user itself. So and I hope we can still have a look at that um, today. So, but first of all, let me talk about how devices actually can sense their own motion. So usually this is done via a so-called IMU, Inertial Measurement Unit, which is built into the phone uh, 
just about any modern phone has one. And they actually contains uh, three different sensors. The primary one is the accelerometer, um, which measures acceleration. Uh, that means if I move the device quickly from left to right, then I will get one peak in the accelerometer when, when I start moving, and I will get a second peak in the other direction when it stops. Um, however, on top of that motion data, it will always also sense the gravity, because this is also an acceleration. So um, if I hold it like this, then I will get a, a gravity vector pointing downwards, even if the device is not moving uh, at all. What's important here is, um, just using the accelerometer, I can't uh, detect if I rotate the de device like this, because the gravity vector will always point straight downwards, and for the other axis, I won't get any uh, signal at all. Um, so for this reason, most devices contain two other sensors. If you have a really, really low-end uh, device, then sometimes it will really only contain an accelerometer, but most contain two other sensors. And this is uh, basically just a compass, a digital compass, or more technically, a magnetometer, which measures the magnetic field. And um, in theory, it will always measure the direction to the North Pole. Uh, so, and if I use that in conjunction with the accelerometer, then I can also detect if I turn it like this, because the magnetic direction will change. I think North is over there. I will simply get a different reading for the magnetic sensor. Drawback here is that if I have uh, if I'm simply in a building or if I have some large metal thing nearby, maybe, uh, I don't know, a car, for example, then that might very well disturb the magnetic field and I might get a quite different direction pointing north. And um, for that reason, there's a third sensor in there, which is uh, the gyroscope. Um, which measures uh, the rate of turn. So for the gyroscope, I will get, uh, get a signal when I turn it like this. It's similar to the accelerometer. I will first get a signal once I start turning, and then I will get a, another signal when I stop turning again. Um, at, and of course, at a specific rate in between. Um, and I can put all of these measurements three sensors, three axes for each one, so nine measurements in total. I can put all of these into a, a smart algorithm and in theory come up with a, with a relatively stable orientation for the device. So for example, if I walk past a, a car and the magnetic field suddenly changes, then I can kind of look at the data from the gyroscope and see if the device has actually turned or not, and if it hasn't, then I can assume that the magnetic data was somehow disturbed and can ignore that for a moment, maybe. So uh, this is really, it's quite own research field called sensor, sensor fusion. How can I put all of these different meanings of data together into one, uh, one coherent uh, value, basically? Um, yeah, that's what I already mentioned, so I can get uh, I put these nine measurements together somehow, and then I get one, uh, uh, basically one three value vector which describes the, the orientation of the device. And when I'm outside maybe, then I can combine this with GPS and get a full so-called pose with a total of six values, three describing the exact position and three describing the exact orientation. Um, Usually these sensors pull quite a lot of power when I'm running them all the time. So in general, only the accelerometer is active and only at a very low update rate to simply detect if I have, have rotated my phone in, into portrait mode, mode or, or back again. <clears throat> so how is this actually solved within the device? These sensors are so-called microelectronic uh, my, micro electromechanical systems, sorry, got it wrong myself. Uh, that means that directly on the um, silicon chip, you have small mechanical structures, really small ones. Here's an 
electron microscope image of an accelerometer. And what you can see is here in the center, this is actually just more or less a weight. And these structures up here, these are little springs. So um, if I now move the entire thing to the left, then this weight will get pulled to the right a little bit. And uh, the, the springs will stop it, of course, but I can sense this very small displacement and use that, for example, to calculate the uh, acceleration. I can put all of this on the same chip along with the required electronics, so I can get one really tiny single uh, IMU all integrated into one. Um, so the accelerometer just measures how far this, this weight is displaced. The um, gyroscope has two very tiny weights again, which vibrate and which then can be used to detect uh, how they are turned. And the, um, the magnetometer measures the so-called Hall effect, which gives you a measurement of magnetic field. Um, what's uh, maybe important to note, so here's illustrations for both. That's not maybe so important right now. What's important, however, is that you need actually three individual ones of these devices. Every, so you need three different accelerometers, you need three Hall sensors and um, three gyroscope. Uh, because everyone can only sense rotation along, for example, along one axis or acceleration along one axis. So for all three directions of space, you will always need three of them and all together give you nine different um, measurements. All right, so I think we're already um, nearly done for today. So I think we'll have to shift uh, leftover bits to next week again. Um, are there any more questions or comments up to here also regarding sensors and so on? If not, then thanks for listening. See you next week. <laughs> <coughs>